Amen. Well, peace be with you. Uh, three experiences of claiming to hear the voice of God. Here is the first, okay? Uh, David Koresh, uh, he led a, a group who came to be known as the Branch Davidians. And he kind of, uh, he, the name David Koresh wasn't his real name, but that was the name that uh, he gave himself. And uh, David comes from the David from the Bible. You know, Psalm 23, David, slayer of Goliath, David. And then um, Koresh is a version of the name Cyrus that we come across in the Bible and the book of Ezra and other places. So he combined them together and he fashioned himself to be a kind of, uh, a kind of new Messiah, uh, leading a group of people, this, famed and, uh, this uh, faithful remnant towards the imminent return of Jesus. And they had a compound in Waco, Texas. And those of you who recall watching the news back then, it ended horribly. Uh, in April 1993, over 70 people uh, died. David Koresh claimed to receive messages from God. Okay. Andre Bitov was a Russian novelist. He grew up as an atheist. Uh, now, when he was uh, 27, he was experiencing a time of despair. He was really low in his life, and that's the moment when he felt that he heard a divine voice. And that voice said, without God, life makes no sense. And so that was the moment where he started to explore this whole God thing and, and come to believe in God. And as it is described to us, when he started to enter into the light, now, Andre Bitov uh, claimed to receive that message from God. Third experience, a young man attending Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia on the Halifax campus was increasingly bothered by the poverty that he saw around the perimeter of the campus. And he wasn't sure what to do about it. It made him really uncomfortable. And so he was praying about this one night in his dorm room, and he had this strong feeling. He didn't hear an audible voice, but he had this strong feeling that he should spend some of his food money, right, from your meal plan, on buying some extra sandwiches and muffins and just carry them around with him in his backpack with his laptop and his other stuff, and when he saw someone who he thought needed it, to give it out. He didn't hear an audible voice, but that's what he did, and he claims that he felt like he received a message from God. And so that's three experiences. David Koresh, novelist Andre Bitov, and a young man named Andrew attending Dalhousie University all claim to receive a message from God. How do we know what is a message from God and what is not? Now, I want to be clear. Uh, David Koresh did not receive messages from God. Okay? He was not well. Okay? So I put that in a bit of, bit of a different category. But as we're trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we discern a message from God if God does, in fact, communicate to his people? Now, get this. In chapter 10, verse 27, in John's Gospel, a passage we're going to look at today, Jesus says, my sheep, listen to, my sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, to those original disciples, that, that made sense. They were physically there in the first century in Judea. They were walking with Jesus, right? So sound waves were coming out of his mouth and were physically going into their ears. So that made sense for them. But what about us today? How do we discern? How do we hear the voice of Jesus when he's not physically with us? When we need a word of encouragement, when we need a word of wisdom or direction for a difficult or perhaps a life-changing decision or even just a word of hope, how do we discern that? Well, today that's what we're going to explore, and it's a question we are going to answer uh, over the course of this uh, message. And so our text today is uh, John 10, and uh, reading through, uh, starting at verse 22. And so this is a part of our walkthrough through the Gospel of John. And uh, I've just appreciated this. I love going through line by line. There's so much richness in this text. What a gift uh, the scriptures are to us, uh, that they've been preserved for us. John, one of the apostles, he's there. He's talking with Jesus. He's recording these things down. They've been preserved for us. What a gift. Uh, and we can learn from the, mo the mouth of Jesus himself. Okay, so chapter 10, beginning at verse 22. I'm reading from the ESV. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Okay, so to quickly set the, set the scene, it's the Feast of Dedication. Uh, so what this was, was back in the year 164 B.C. So this is, you know, several generations before Jesus and the apostles. Uh, bad things had happened in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, there was this Seleucid king named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Um, talk about a name to be on a tombstone. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, right? Uh, who considered himself to be divine, by the way. So he led this, uh, this, you know, this, this 
you know, uprising, and, and they took the, the Jewish temple. They desecrated, did ungodly things in there. And this was really harmful and hurtful to the Jewish people. It's their temple, for goodness sakes. And so there was a leader, a deliverer, named Judas Maccabeus. Okay, so not the 12 apostles, Judas, who betrayed Jesus. This is another Judas Maccabeus. So he, lends the, he leads this three-year revolt. They overtake the temple. They cleanse it. And so they rededicate themselves to God's service, the priesthood. They rededicate the temple to have all these sacrifices and everything else. And so they had this feast, this festival, to commemorate the rededication of the temple. Today it's called Hanukkah, right? So we know Hanukkah's out there, and Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah. Also called the Festival of Lights, okay? So here they are. It says it's winter. Makes sense, right? Because that's when it occurs. It's always been that time. And Jesus is walking in the Jerusalem temple in the colonnade of Solomon, Verse 24, so the Jews gathered around him. Recall that that means not just all Jews, it's the specific religious authorities who are opposing Jesus. They gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Christ, remember, means Messiah. Christ is Greek for anointed one. Messiah is Hebrew for anointed one. Are you the anointed one? Are you God's chosen king and representative on the earth? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Right? So Jesus has indicated to them, and not only that, but he's done things to prove that he is who he says he is. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Now, my sheep. Now, here he's pulling on that metaphor that he used previously. Remember last week he said he was the good shepherd. The good shepherd, and we are the sheep, and he's going to protect us, and the gate for the sheep, and the pasture, all that stuff. So he's summoning all those images back to people's minds again uh, when he talks about uh, sheep. Now, I just have to say that uh, last week, um, after the message, um, one of our congregants, uh, Chris Charlebois, sent me a reel on Instagram. This is the, oh, I saw this, and it was so funny, and I had to show it to you. So remember last week, we talked about the sheep, and they're following the shepherd's voice. You really got to be dialed into the voice of the shepherd. You don't want to be led astray. Because the text says that we're not to listen to the voice of strangers. We need to listen to the voice of the shepherd. And so she sent me this reel, and uh, it's on three-minute three, three minute news, so we give credit to them. It's this woman who was out running, and she came across this sheep, uh, uh, this, this flock of sheep. They had obviously gotten lost, uh, and so they latched onto her. They assumed that she was the shepherd. And so she's running through the bush, and there's this, this, this flock of sheep following her. And uh, she stops to check her phone, and they stop, and she starts to run to get away from them, and they... Follow her. It's hilarious. Let's watch it. <laughs> Look at this. Like, how did this happen? And she goes, she takes off. And then they run after her. <laughs> well, that's an image for so many things in life. You know, there you go. <laughs> anyway, so you want to be following the right voice and not the wrong one, okay? So I just like with Christine, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and they follow me, not the voice of strangers, actually following Jesus, right? Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Uh, how the Greek actually manuscript is constructed here, it's a double negative, which in Greek is for emphasis. So it's like the sense here is they will never ever perish, Imagine the tenor, the tone of Jesus' voice escalating here. They will never, ever perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, uh, it's interesting. This, for those of you who read theology and, and uh, are really interested in doctrine, uh, there's something called the perseverance of the saints or um, called eternal security. The idea is, can someone lose their salvation? Can someone who has, and maybe you've had this question of yourself, maybe someone you love, you care about, a friend, or maybe someone in your family, they've had this faith, you think they've had this faith, but they fall away. Can someone lose their salvation? And this is one of the passages, this and many others, they kind of tell us how to respond to a situation like that. He says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, the short answer is that if someone's faith and confession of faith in the risen Jesus was genuine, then no, they cannot fall away. Why? Because no one can snatch them out of Jesus' hand, and Jesus' hand is the Father's hand, as he will say in the next verses, right? Uh, there's a helpful note in the Reformation Study Bible. We may fall for a season, but never fully or finally fall away. We may fall for a season, but never fully or finally fall away. And of course, that's connected to what Paul says 
in Philippians 1.6, which is he, God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He is working in you, okay? So that kind of uh, touches on that, which to me is a very reassuring doctrine. We may we struggle, but if our, if our faith in Christ is genuine, we will not fully and finally fall away. God's grip is great, okay? So having said that, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. I and the father are one. Now this is one of those passages, a very enigmatic statement. This is one of the places where we learn something about uh, the divinity of Jesus. I and the father are one. Again, how the text is constructed in Greek, um, it shows us it doesn't mean that they're the same person. It means that they're the same thing or the same essence. As the Nicene Creed says, Jesus is of one being with the Father, okay? So uh, all of this and other passages inform our understanding of the Trinity. So God the Father is one person. God the Son, Jesus, is one person. God the Holy Spirit is one person. Um, but they're together one God, three in one, one in three. And so, this is, so Jesus is speaking of himself in, in incredibly highly exalted terms. And we've already dis- discovered this a little bit, right? With all those I am statements. He is saying things that only the God of Israel says. He is doing things like forgiving sins that only the God of Israel does. And so Jesus is this God come to us in human form. They are one. Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Why would they do that? Well, sometimes people today, uh, critics, uh, of Scripture say, you know what, uh, Jesus actually didn't ever claim to be divine. It's just that people are reading that back into the text. People at the time never thought that. It's simply inaccurate. Not only is Jesus saying and doing things that only the God of Israel does, as we have seen, but the people there pick up stones to stone him. Why? Because in Leviticus 24, it says, if you blaspheme the name of the Lord, you are to be stoned. So the people there are actually thinking that Jesus is making himself out to be God because that's what he is doing. And watch how this plays out. Uh, Verse 32, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Right, so that's what they knew him to be doing. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken or set aside, Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Okay, so there's a a bunch there. It's kind of a bit of a a very compact, tricky argument. So uh, what's happening? So when Jesus says, as it is written in your law, Now, the word law usually refers to the first five books of the Bible called the Law of Moses, but sometimes it's used to refer to the entire Old Testament. And that's what's happening here, because why? He's actually quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. Now, in that passage, in that passage of the context is, is, is about human judges. So human judges who are called small g, quote unquote, gods, why? Because they are sharing the judgment of God, sharing the word of God with people. And so Jesus is saying, if scripture concedes that, that high title to them, then you surely should be open to calling, be calling me the son of God because I came directly from him. And so that's kind of the sense, the logic of his argument. He's telling them that, that, that they should be open to who he is. Uh, but I also want to not miss in here verse 35. Jesus says, scripture cannot be broken. Some translations, Scripture cannot be set aside. Now, what's going on? I just want to highlight that Jesus has a very high view of Scripture, a very exalted, very high view of Scripture. He wasn't dismissive. So for him, that would have been the Old Testament. Now, Jesus commissions the New Testament, as we find in John 14. But he, he had a very high view of Scripture. So what happens? Whenever he's settling dispute, he continually refers to Scripture. When Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, what does he do? He He defends his actions and what he should do based on Scripture. He quotes three short creeds from Deuteronomy 6 and 8. Uh, Jesus, uh, he often says in debates, he says, as it is written, which is the ancient way of saying the Bible says, uh, in uh, Mark 7 and and other places, he calls uh, the commands of Moses, the laws of Moses, the word of God and the commands of God. So he has a very high view of the Scriptures. The Savior trusted them, so should we. Okay? Continuing, verse 39, again, they sought to arrest him, 
but he escaped from their hands. He went away across the Jordan, meaning the river Jordan, to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. And that little Bible maps, that's Perea. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Praise be to God. Um, and so that kind of ends the text for today. But we can't help but notice that Jesus does all of this at the Feast of Dedication. And there is this deliverer, this hero, Judas Maccabeus. But Jesus has just said things and demonstrated that he is, in fact, the true and ultimate deliverer, higher than Judas Maccabeus. And that was called what the Hanukkah is also called the Feast of Lights. And Jesus had just also taught us that he is the light of the world in John 8, verse 12. So I think all of those illusions and images would have been in the background of people's minds, helping people to come to belief in him, as some do in verse 42. This is the word of the Lord. We zero in on verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And as I said before, that was one thing to those original disciples. They were there. They were walking with Jesus. They heard his actual voice and those sound waves went into the cranium. But what about us? And so we're going to explore this. It's called the process of discernment. How do we discern, hear the voice of Jesus when he's not physically here? And as I do this, I want to give a caution, a premise, and a thesis before we get going. Caution, premise, and the caution is not all actual voices are from God. So we need to be clear about that, right? David Koresh did not hear from God. Uh, other people, there, there's other people sometimes who hear voices. Maybe someone's unwell. And so someone needs to talk to someone. They need to, uh, you know, seek some medical advice. Perhaps that is one of those situations, right? Um, could be a voice of someone else. Could be your own voice. Uh, could Something medically could, co- could be going on. Could be Satan's voice, you know? So just voices, just all voices aren't, aren't the voices of God. So we just need to know that. The premise is that is, is, it is, in fact, possible to receive messages from God. So having said what I've just said, it is, in fact, possible to hear messages from God. Some people hear an audible voice. Most people today do not. Most people experience this through the normal way and the regular way that God communicates with his people, which is primarily through Scripture these days, okay? But the premise is that uh, we can, in fact, receive messages from God. G. Campbell Morgan was a Bible teacher. He said this, Wherever there are hearts waiting for the voice of God, that voice is to be heard. Wherever there are hearts waiting for the voice of God, that voice is to be heard. Think of it like radio frequencies. You're driving along in your car. You know, you're you're driving down the highway to work or coming to church. There's frequencies all around you. Right? Like, Like, maybe you have your radio off, but you could turn it on. All of a sudden, you could tune into, you know, you know, AM 1050, or, you know, you listen to sports on 590, and the news, 640, there's Life 100.3, Rock 95, Cool FM. There's all these frequencies around you, but you tune it on, you dial into a certain frequency. That's the process of discernment. Tuning out the wrong things, tuning in the right thing, that's the process of discernment we are going to explore. And the thesis is this, you hear God's voice by seeking God's voice. And the reason we need to say that is because when we hear the word hear, we think passive, sitting back, I'm not doing anything. And although God will communicate with people when and where he wants, as a general principle, hearing is a verb. It's an action word. We are doing things proactively, things set out for us in Scripture, as we will see, to proactively dial ourselves into the right frequency to hear the voice of Jesus. And so we're going to look at those five things. And up on the screen, you'll see kind of a pie chart with five chunks. And we're going to fill those in. And the first is going to be filled in with the Bible. Okay? Now, that's the main one. That's not a surprise to anybody. But we've got to be clear that the primary place where we learn about God's will is the Bible. The primary place. What does Jesus say in verse 35? Scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be set aside. Never does Jesus do so. Never should we. It cannot be broken. It cannot be set aside. So we have to be immersing ourselves in the Scriptures. Let me give you a very simplistic but I think helpful example. You've been praying for happiness. God, make me happy. I'm in such a difficult place. Please make me happy. You're in Walmart. And... uh, not necessarily praying in Walmart, I'll go ahead. Um, and you're there, and there's these earphones, and they're just so amazing, and you love the, those earphones are going to make me happy. Maybe God is communicating to me that I need to steal and take those earphones. Um, <clears throat> well, what does it say in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20? Thou shalt not. All right, so that's a simplistic example, but it tells you that if you think that you're receiving a message from God, and that message contravenes, What Scripture says, you are not receiving a message from God. 
okay? Even though you're getting really excited about those headphones in aisle 42 of Walmart, <clears throat> okay? John Piper talks about the importance of Scripture and immersing ourselves in a, in a, in a culture which is increasingly kind of tail-spinning away uh, from biblical morality, from a biblical worldview. He writes, Without the saturation of Scripture, people become increasingly vulnerable to the winds of false teaching and more subtly, the conditioning of unbelieving society. So without being immersed in Scripture, that becomes our default, is kind of what the culture is uh, doing. Now, there was a, uh, a woman named Jennifer who was listening to a sermon by Pastor Steve Bradley, not the Barry Steve Bradley who used to work at the radio station, but someone else. And he was preaching about hearing God's call on your life. And um, after the service, she approached uh, him and said, Steve, I hear voices all the time. How do I know the difference between hearing the voice of God and hearing the voices of my own sick mind? And with great compassion and care, he looked upon her and, and he said, uh, Dear one, we all have to check, the, we all have to check the voices of our own sick mind with the Bible. Daily, you are no different. We all have to check the voices of our own sick mind. With the Bible daily, you are no different. All right, second on that chart is prayer. Now, although Jesus doesn't specifically talk about prayer in this, how do we talk to God? How do we communicate with God? Well, we do so through prayer. Now, later on, he's going to say something that, uh, Jesus will say something that is very reminiscent of something else he said in the um, Sermon on the Mount, in John 16, 24, Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. There is something powerful about prayer. There is something mysterious about prayer. And God gives us prayer. He tells us to do it. He tells us that it works. What does it say in uh, James uh, 5, 16? The prayer of a righteous person, meaning the prayer of a godly per a person, is powerful and effective. And so it works. It is powerful and effective. And so prayer is something we do as a spiritual discipline over time. And we're in the scripture. We're doing some of the other things that is, is going to be on this chart. And we will find that we will start to have clarified in our minds more and more what is the will of God for the situations we face. Third, counsel. Now, what is that? Is this about being on a leather couch in someone's uh, office? Not really. Uh, the idea is it's seeking out the counsel of other godly people. Okay, the Puritans, who are great thinkers in this regard, called it conference. Not as in going to a conference, but conferring with other godly people, right? Sometimes we get in these silos and we think and we get, you know, just our thoughts are bouncing around in our own minds and, and, just, and just we can kind of get into this tailspin. Uh, so we confer, we, we seek counsel of other godly people. See, what does Jesus say? He talks to sheep who are in the context of other sheep. My sheep, plural, hear my voice. I know them, plural, and they, plural, follow me. So within the flock, right, someone's off, you know, down at the creek getting a drink, and they forget what the shepherd said. They're like, oh, I missed that last one. Oh, they're going to talk to the other sheep, and the other sheep is going to clarify it for them, right? And so this is all about seeking other godly people. How many times have you been unsure about something, and you realize you know you, know you should actually verbalize this to someone, and so you seek someone out that you trust, uh, who is faithful, who has some life experience. How many times do we do that and we come out of there thinking, you know what, they gave me something to think about that I hadn't thought of before. Or they had a certain experience, I didn't know they had a certain experience that was like mine, and what they said really helped me. Maybe they thought of a scripture passage that, oh, I, I hadn't thought of that before, and, and that's how they've applied that to my situation. I'm so grateful to them. Let me tell you this, God puts people in our lives to help us pilot our lives. God puts people in our lives to help us pilot our lives. One of my own memory verses, Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Isn't that good? Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Fourth, humility. Sheep. Think of sheep. Think of the sheep. They're humble creatures. They are predators? No. They're prey. They're prey. They're, they're like the quintessential prey out there. They need a shepherd. They need help from an outside source. They are humble. And part of the thing with being humble is that people who are humble also happen to be teachable. They're teachable. 
So if you're not thinking and acting with humility, then you are closing yourself off to hear from God. Why? Because your proud and arrogance are going to be uh, going to be because of closing out what God might be wanting to say to you. You'll be more concerned with what you want than what God wants. People who lack humility lack receptivity to the voice of God. You see it time and time again. People who lack humility lack receptivity to the voice of God. Consider just a few of the things that Scripture says about humility. Now, earlier in this gospel, uh, in chapter 3, verse 30, uh, John the Baptist says this about Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. That's about humility. He, Jesus, must increase, I must... This is John the Baptist. People are flocking to him. Jesus must increase, I must decrease. Proverbs 12, verse 2, with humility comes wisdom. Because you're teachable, you're open to what the Lord might say to you. Jesus, in Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself, who is ever puffed up, will be humbled. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And the implication is they will be exalted from God. And then that very famous proverb, 16, verse 18, pride, arrogance, goes before destruction. A haughty spirit, an arrogant spirit, goes before a fall. And then this, and this, this one I'm about to quote appears three different times in scriptures. God opposes the proud. This is James 4, 6. God opposes the, he opposes proud people. But he shows grace. He gives grace to the humble. That's a promise, you know. He gives grace to the humble. In his book, Blind Spots, Colin Hansen talks about how Christians have different blind spots. Okay? So you know you're driving in a car and there's a blind spot. You kind of have to contort yourself to see what that blind spot is. Who's there? Is there any danger? And he says, really, there's three categories of blind spots that Christians have. The first, the first group is people who are just almost exclusively focused on doctrinal truth. This is what is doctrinally correct. Their blind spot is compassion. That's quite often what happens. I'm so focused on doctrinal truth that I really kind of, you know, I, I'm just not really that compassionate. That's, that's a blind spot, and that's a problem, right? There's another group of people who are so focused on kind of showing acts of mercy and compassion that they are actually closed to the truth and holiness of God. And they've lost their kind of compass about what is right and wrong, what is sin and what isn't. And so <clears throat> that's their blind spot. There's other people, and their blind spot is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, everything, you know, the whole thing. Because they are just so in love with their own comfort and their own little box. They just want to stay, do this. Uh, and, and not only are they neglecting the great commandment, but they're also neglecting doctrinal truth because it's in Scripture and compassion because being a great <laughs> commission disciple is actually for the good of other people. And so the reason I say this now in this section on humility is if you're not humble, if you're not teachable, you're going to live life without any awareness of your own blind spots, and in fact, you don't care because you're too proud and arrogant. So humility opens up, what am I missing? Maybe God is communicating to me through one of these areas, and I've just been close to it because I'm proud. Okay? You simply cannot be full of God's wisdom if you are already full of yourself. You simply cannot be full of God's wisdom if you are already full of yourself. And the fifth one is love. Now, what is it? Love. Love is, here's a definition, proactively seeking God's best for someone, often in a self-sacrificial way. Love is proactively, so we're not sitting back, we're proactively seeking God's best for someone. So it specifically has to be God's best. God's best for someone, often in a self-sacrificial way. And some of the reason it's quite often self-sacrificial is because it's based on the love of Jesus, which, you know, is based on giving his own life for us. John 3, 16, John 15, 13, etc., right? And so let's say you've gone through the previous four. Uh, you've read the Bible, uh, you've been praying about something, uh, you're seeking the counsel of other godly people, you've sought to cultivate humility. If what you are about to do based on that message you think you are receiving from God doesn't compel you to act in greater love toward people, you've gone into the ditch. And this one is actually tied back with the first one because what does the Bible teach is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. So they all fit together. Jesus articulates it well. John 13, verses 34, 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one 
another. Now, this is difficult. I appreciate that. There are times when doing the loving thing, uh, seeking God's best for someone, and often in a self-sacrificial way, um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take you out of your comfort zone. It might not be what someone else wants. Um, but that's what we're called to do. And if the messages and the voice of Jesus that we hear kind of coming through in our life doesn't compel us to, to want to love people with greater authenticity, then we've, we've gone off the rails, okay? Now, those are the five, and I put a little ring around it, kind of a big circle, like a blue circle, and if we were to label what that circle is, that motion around those, it's time. And the reason I put that there is because uh, we're in the age of the quick fix. We are in the age of instant gratification. We've become used to microwaves. We've become used to drive-through windows. We've become used to instant messaging someone on the other side of planet Earth instantly. We can order something on Amazon Prime and get it so quickly. We're used to instant. But guess what? God doesn't work on our timetables necessarily. He works in his timing, not necessarily what we want the timing to be. So let's say, oh, I got a big decision to make. Okay, that's a Bible verse. I'm going to pray, but God help me. And talk to someone, hey, send them a text. Hey, how's that? And humility. Okay, yeah, I'll try that. Love. You know, you can't rush it. Sometimes it takes time. Something I quoted last week was from Neil Anderson, Timothy Warner. I think it's worth quoting again. Knowing the shepherd's voice is not a matter of formal education, it is the result of spending lots of time with him. Isn't that good? Knowing the shepherd's voice isn't a matter of formal education. Spending lots of what? Time with him. And so we do this over time to discern the shepherd's voice. Okay, we're going to end with a bit of an experiment, a bit of a project, okay? So you have a role in this, and I think it helps us illustrate the point in a helpful way. And so there's going to be a couple messages up on the board here, okay? And... <clears throat> Uh, this is about discerning a message from God. So uh, there's someone in the congregation right now who has a unique message, okay, that I'm sure we'd all love to hear. Um, let's say that message is from God. Well, what we're going to do is this. So if your first name starts from A to F, so A through F, so Andrew, Andrea, Bob, etc., through the F, uh, when I say go, you say this. Just do whatever you want because no one really cares anyway, okay? If your name begin, first name begins with uh, the letters G through L, when I say go, and this is all going to happen at the same time, you say, you think too much about others, so just follow your heart wherever it leads, okay? If your first name begins M through R, say, hey, party people, we're here for a good time, not a long time, okay? Uh, S to Z, the first name starts with those letters, say, God just wants you to be happy, so live your truth and have some ice cream, okay? So, that's, so when I say go, everyone's going to say that at the same time. And don't just whisper it. Say it like you normally would, okay? Uh, there's going to be one distinct message in the midst of everyone, okay? Everyone knows what they're supposed to do? You know what? Okay. On your mark, it said, Go. <laughs> Wow, that was, that was chaos. What? How are we supposed to hear anything in the midst of that? We're going to do it again. On your mark, get set, go. <laughs> that, my friends, is what we encounter on a daily basis in our world, in our lives, and sometimes in our own heads and so part of the job is tuning out the wrong frequencies, the wrong voices. And we do this with these five practices over the course of time that we might discern the voice of God. Now, the person with the special message, would they please stand up? All right. What does it say? Though the wolves of life bear their teeth, in my footsteps alone will find protection and peace. Mm. Well, the wolves of life, thank you, Mark, bear their teeth, in my footsteps alone you will find protection and peace. That is very much different than everything else everyone said. Okay? So discernment is about tuning out the wrong voices and tuning into the right voice. If you were praying about something and that, that message was coming through to you and you couldn't hear it because of all the other noises, all the other chaos, what a tragedy that would be. Let me close with this thought about baby penguins. Baby penguins are amazing and they're cute. 
I see pictures of a baby penguin. Wow. They're also exceptional creatures. A baby penguin is able to pick out its mother's voice in a colony of up to one million penguins. <laughs> There's like documentaries on penguins. Um, able to pick out its mother's voice in a colony of up to one million penguins. I love that. That's discernment, my friends. Max Lucado has said, live with one ear toward heaven. Friends, live with one ear towards heaven. Let's seek to do that uh, as we seek to discern the voice of Jesus, even though we physically can't hear it. Why? Because this is what he says. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Thanks be to God. Amen.